us more than what we needed. You, you helped us in ways we can't even imagine. You blessed us beyond all recognition. You are a God who has helped us, Lord. We, we were dead in our sins, dead in our transgressions. There was no hope for people like us. And one day, your son Jesus rode into Jerusalem to become our king, king of kings, Lord of lords. And more importantly for me today, my Lord, for everyone in this place that's accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, God, I just pray to help them to know that, that Jesus is their Lord. You are a personal God, a personal Lord, a Savior for us. And today, Lord, if there is someone here that doesn't know that, help them to know that today. God, you have not always met what we expect you to meet in our life. You've not always done what we expect you to do. But you have done the great things as you became the king of our life. Help us to recognize that today. To know that you went beyond beyond Lord God, we can imagine that. And you bless us for each other. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. I, I've, got, I've got a video that I want to show to you this morning. Um, I don't always know how to pick a video off. This is one of those that, that I just need to tell you that the name of it is Expectation. <clears throat> Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. <laughs> okay, today is your birthday. You are 27 years old, honey. And I, I had a meeting to take something that I'm about to do. Very special for you. Today, you are going to receive something that you have been wanting for, for since I've known you. And I've saved up a lot of money. And that motorcycle, <laughs> that motorcycle you've always wanted outside the house waiting for you. I, I, I have not been able to sleep last night. I'm so excited. So I'm about to wake you up. I hope you're not in a grumpy mood that you usually are when you wake up. <laughs> and today you won't be in a grumpy mood for a while. <laughs> okay, happy birthday for your 27th birthday. Okay, love you. Jayden, are you ready to wake daddy for his big birthday? Hold on one second. Happy, happy birthday. It's happening you to get up. Woo! It's your birthday, boy. And you look absolutely stunning. It's your birthday. Yay! All right, Jay, let me tell you. Honey, this on here. Okay. Basically, honey, there's two clues that I wanted to leave you with this morning. Number one, okay, this is your big present. Are you ready? Okay, number one is that I have saved up tons and tons of money that we've been putting aside, okay? And number two, it wouldn't fit inside. Are you ready to come and find it with me? Wait, what do you mean you saved up tons of money? I just, just a couple, couple paychecks. Wait, what? Honey, just don't worry about it. Just this you probably need a motorcycle. <laughs> I don't know. You got a motorcycle? I got a motorcycle. Oh, that's a surprise. Okay, just hold on. You did not. I don't know. Okay, close your eyes. Put your shoes on. Put your shoes on. Put your shoes on. Let me go in front. Let me hold your hand. Should I close my eyes? Well, not yet. I'm almost there. Hold on. Okay, are you ready? Can I have my No, wait. Ten, nine, <laughs> eight, seven, six, five, watch your step, four, three, two, one. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead.
maybe some people don't live that way. Maybe if you, you had a blessed life, you got born and raised, great household, incredible school, graduated, top of your class, prom king, prom queen, went to the college you'd always dreamed of, and you graduated from there, got the perfect job, making all kinds of money, hand over fist, and you got married to this great person, two and a half kids, picket fence, got the dog, and you retired early because you made so much money in your life, you trapped it. Is that anybody here? Okay, that's just not a reality for most of us, is it? We, we, don't, we don't always get what we expect out of this life. But when you accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, man, everything changed that day, right? There was no more sickness after that, no more disease, no more hurt, no more pain in your life. Your marriage got better, your kids got better, you got more money at work. Is that, that right? That's the way it worked in your life? Right. Oh, yeah. It didn't always work that way for us, does it? I mean, we come into faith with some expectations. Um, we come to faith in Christ hoping that he will meet our expectations. But I just be honest with you this morning, Christ doesn't always meet those expectations that we have in life. I mean, we, we, we are people that have great expectations of what we think Jesus Christ is going to do for us. And I, and I believe today a lot of people come into faith with, with these great expectations that God's going to change everything about our life. And then when he doesn't, he doesn't. I think it crushes some people. I think some people actually walk out of the faith because Jesus just didn't do what they expected that he was going to do. And this problem is a problem that we're going to see today in our text that we're going to look at this morning. Jesus not meeting a people's expectation. And I'm sure you know a little bit about the story today, but we're going to look at the Palm Sunday text that I read to you earlier today. It's a story about Jesus getting ready to come to Jerusalem. He's going to ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And Jesus has been doing great things. I mean, he, he's been changing the world around Jerusalem in those days. And the people are getting an idea. They're getting an idea that Jesus Christ may be the long-awaited king that they were looking for. The person that they've been hoping would come. And if Jesus is this king that he's supposed to be, that they think he's going to be, their world will change forever. So today, when we read this text, just know this. They were expecting Jesus to be their new, their new king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany in the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this, say, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here shortly. They went and found a colt outside in the street, tied to a doorway. As they untied it, the people standing there asked, what are you doing in tying that colt? They answered as Jesus had told them to, and the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus and threw their clothes over it, he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. And those who went ahead and those who followed shouted, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David! Hosanna! In the highest heavens! Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. What did they expect? What were they expecting that day? I mean, there's a lot of things we can look at. What were the expectations of the disciples that day? What were the expectations of the religious leaders that day? What were the expectations of all the people that were lining this street? What were, what were Jesus' expectations? Maybe the first thing you need to realize is that um, life wasn't great in Israel at this moment. Historically, we know what was going on. Historically, they had been um, overthrown by Rome. Rome was in charge of, of Jerusalem. Rome was in charge of about everything during those days. And, and Israel just didn't like it very well. They didn't like having Rome in charge of them because of, of emperor worship. Uh, the reality was, in Rome, if you were the emperor, you were considered a god. And, and they didn't like that fact. Israel did not like the fact that they believed that, that the world believed that the emperor was the god of the universe. And, and once, once that emperor died, he would go be with all the other gods in the heavens, and there would be a new emperor, and he would be a new god that would come into power. It was emperor worship. And that was a problem in Israel. That was a problem because of the Shema. It says in Deuteronomy chapter 6, The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Worship the Lord your God. 
with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. They believe there was one God in heaven, even the Ten Commandments. It talks about there being one God. Well, in, in Roman life, that wasn't true. They were very polytheistic. They believed in lots of gods, lots of different gods in the universe. And Israel had a problem with that. They had a problem with the fact that they were, they were made to worship a God that they didn't even believe in. Now, now I, I, I'm a very, I am not political. And this is not a political statement. This is to help you understand what it would be like. If we were forced to worship our president, if we were forced to make sacrifices on an altar in his name, I'm sure that every Christian in America would have problems with that. that and whether you like our president or not would be indifferent at that moment in time. It would be, there's no way I am going to worship that person. That's what they were being forced to do. Now, they, they didn't actually bow down because they didn't get to Rome very often. You're okay if you weren't hanging out in Rome. But that was the idea. That was the thought. And they didn't like that. They didn't like that idea. And so they were looking for a savior to come to overthrow Rome. They were looking for a savior to come to take them out of this monarchy so they could be their own nation once again, so they could have their own king once again. And they knew he was coming. They knew he was coming because of the prophecies. The prophecies all through the Old Testament point to the fact that there will be a day when a new king would come. And they thought that king was going to be like David, that was going to set up the throne right there in Israel, and they were going to get, they were going to worship the Lord their God, and this king would rule over them, and they would rule in the name of Yahweh. That's what they were waiting for. That's what they were looking for. And on the day that Jesus comes into Israel, they believed that he was that king. He was that guy. And they did it because of prophecy. He says that Jesus is going to come, or that the king's going to come riding into Jerusalem on a donkey, on the pole of a donkey. Jesus has been healing people. Jesus has been casting out demons. Jesus has raised the dead. There were stories about him that were circulating all over Jerusalem. And people were wondering, is this the Messiah? Is this the God? Is this the Christ? And when Jesus climbs up on that donkey and he starts riding into Jerusalem, all the people get excited because now they know this is the guy. This is our king. He's going to set up a throne in Israel. He's going to rule forever and ever. We're going to be free of Rome. They're so excited. They take their jackets off, throw them on the ground, cut palm branches, wave them in the air. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king. That's not who Jesus came to be. You know, the basic thing about Palm Sunday is that the reason they were worshiping him, the reason they thought they were worshiping him, never happened. He didn't come to do what they wanted him to do. He didn't come to meet their expectations. You know, their expectations Jesus has not met, and he will never meet. I think it's difficult for us sometimes as Christians to realize that there are expectations that Jesus just has not met yet, and there's expectations that I have of Jesus that he's just never going to meet. I, I, I don't know where you're at in your life, but, but I, have, I have prayed over, I have laid hands on people, I have anointed people with oil, I, I have claimed James chapter 5 that Jesus is going to heal people, I, I, I have believed in faith that God would do it. And, God didn't meet those expectations. I worked with couples believing in Jesus' name that God was going to restore the relationship, was going to make everything better. They got divorced. I spent hours working with drug addicts and praying for drug addicts that they would give up this drug and they shoot up and snort up again. Time and time again, God hasn't met my expectations. And, and not just on a personal level, even as a church, you know, I, I have prayed for 19 years that God would bring a band to this church. 19 years I've prayed for, for drummers and guitar players and keyboard players to fill the stage and for us to have this great, you know, you know, people leave churches because they don't have great worship bands. And I'm like, what, why is it? What, why, God, why? And, and all of the guitar players in this world, all the drummers in this world, all the keyboard players, why can't I just get a band together? 19 years. 19 years. I, I turned down a ministry this week. I, I got a call from somebody here in this town, and they needed some space, and I, I had no space to put them in. I have no place that I can do this ministry because every room in this church is booked every day, seven days a week. 
We don't have enough. We can't get the three services because there's not enough space for all of us. There, there are churches all over this town that's got all kinds of space that are not using it. But yet, we, we don't have enough space to meet all the needs we have in this church. And I'm like, God, why don't just open up the doors of heaven, drop a facility someplace on the back? <laughs> God can do that kind of thing, right? And, and you know, the snowstorm they were talking about yesterday, none of you were worried about it. You know what I was worried about? It? It's because we, we operate on such a tight budget here. If we don't have church two weeks in a row, we can't pay our bills. Two, two weeks. We, got enough, we get enough money for about two weeks. I, I, I know churches in this town that's got hundreds of thousands of dollars sitting in their banks. And I pray that God would bless us financially. And when it comes to God meeting my expectations, he just doesn't always do it. And it's, not, it's not just me. It's not just us here. I mean, there are kids in this world that are starving. And I kind of expect God to do something about that. And I expect God to find ways to get clean water to people. I'll just give you one since last week. We've got some missionaries in Papua New Guinea. Um, wonderful young couple. Um, they've been over there now for about three years, two years. I think they're in their third year. Um, this is their first time being missionaries on the missionary field. Do you, do, I, I'm real serious. How many of you heard that two weeks ago there was an earthquake in Papua New Guinea? 7.6. How many? Uh, did you see it on the news? Did you hear about it any place? No, because you know Papua New Guinea is not really important to America, and so they did they didn't advertise this. 7.6 earthquake. It's taken out most of the bridges. They can't get from one area to another in Papua New Guinea because the bridges have just collapsed. Um, our missionary couples that are there, they, they lost their house in it. The water is not really safe to drink there, and so they have they have rainwater that goes into this big holding tank off of the roof of their house to drink out of, and it toppled that over, and now they're having to drink out of the creek. Um, they're, they're, our missionary couples are actually living right now in tents um, because they don't have a place to stay. Their house isn't safe until we can get missionaries over there to to tear their house, finish tearing it down, and to build them a new place, they're going to have to stay in tents. And, and in my head, I'm kind of like going, okay, God, here's this, this young couple with four kids that left everything here in the United States to go to Papua New Guinea so they can spread the word of Christ. Why could you not have held their house up? Like, why could you not just have sent a couple angels to wrap your arms around it while the shaking was going on so they didn't lose it? Am I the only person here that ever, ever wonders why God doesn't meet my expectations? And the sad reality is, is many people walk away from God because he doesn't. But when an event happens in life that shakes us to the core, there are times that people just give up on God. They're just, they're just done, right? I mean, you get hurt, a bad thing happens, sickness comes into your life, something you didn't expect. At that moment, can I say the easy thing to do? It's just to kind of walk. Just, I, you know, I'm, I'm done. God, I'm just, if you're not going to meet my expectations, I'm just, I'm out of this thing. I think so many people find themselves, so many people, they just, they just walk on God. And that's what's going on in our text. Here are these people. They're worshiping the Lord. They got their palm branches out. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That's on Palm Sunday. You know what happens by the time Friday rolls around? The same crowd of people, one of the 12 actually, is going to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces of silver because Jesus doesn't meet Judas' expectations. And not just Judas, this crowd of people, there's a whole bunch of religious leaders there, they want to get Jesus on a cross. And the people that are shouting, that are waving palm branches, by the time that Friday comes around, they're yelling, crucify, crucify, crucify. See, it only took six days, it only took six days from praising God to crucify. It only took six days from worshiping the Lord to say, we want Barabbas set free, put Jesus on a cross. And I would like to say that I'm better than that. I would like to say I, I, I'm not that way. But can I tell you, there been times in my life that I've sat in pews on a Sunday morning, gritting my teeth, because God has not met my expectations. But most of you don't know uh, this is about Peggy and I. Um, we've been married for a few years. We were, we were trying to have kids and... Uh, uh, we couldn't have any. Um, we spent six years going through infertility treatments. 
Um, six years of doctors, six years of shots, six years of medications, six years to have a doctor tell us the only way you're going to have kids is in vitro fertilization. Um, we, we did not have insurance. We had already spent a small fortune in our life on trying to have children. And one day, after six years, we just said, let's buy a dog. And Rocky came into our life. Because we didn't think that we'd ever have a child. And I remember, I remember the Mother's Day that we sat in the church. And the pastor said, I want all the moms to stand up today. And all the moms stood up. We gave them all a big hand clap. Then he, they said this, and he says, all of you that are expecting to be moms one day, I want you to all stand up too. And out of the 300 people in that church that day, there was one woman who sat in her seat. It was my wife, Peggy. Because we had just been told we would never have any children. So she no longer even expected to be alone. I was not happy in God that day. I may not have spit on him on the cross, but I worshiped him through clenched teeth. I think some of you have been there. Some of you know what that's like for God not to meet your expectations. And it's difficult when he doesn't. But you know, during those times of disappointment, God works in exceeding our expectations. You see, I, I tell you the story, six years of infertility, six years of struggle, six years of financial trouble, and six years later we find out, we find out we're going to have a son, we find out we're pregnant. <laughs> None of the infertility stuff worked, it actually happened naturally, who would have thought? <laughs> Come to church here and we get invited to come and pastor this church. And the first Sunday here, we invited there six women struggling with infertility. Six women who couldn't have babies. <clears throat> and my wife went to them and embraced them and said, I know what it feels like. I've been through that. I know the struggle with your husband. I, I know how you're feeling worthless. I know how you're feeling like the one job God gave you to have a baby. Now you can't even do that one job. I know what that feels like because I've been there. And we saw God in some ways open up this door that we had. It was something better than what we ever imagined. Because God didn't give us what we wanted when we wanted it. God didn't give us what we wanted when we wanted it. And God began to work at exceeding our expectations. And again and again and again, we've watched God not give us what we want, but He exceeds it. He does more than what we can even imagine. Now, here, here's Jesus. He's on the road to Jerusalem. The people are waving their palm branches. What are they wanting? They're wanting a king that's going to climb up on a throne in Jerusalem, going to overthrow the Roman world, that's going to set up a new kingdom right there in Israel. That's what they want. And Jesus could have done it. He could have given them that. He could have sat on the throne. He could still be reigning there today. You see, Jesus would have never died because he had no sin in his life. He had never messed up. So there would have been no death in it. He would have still been sitting on the throne today. 2,000 years later, there would have been complete peace on this earth. There would have never been another war. There would have been another, never have been another earthquake. Everything would have been perfect in this world because Jesus would have reigned here. And if he would have done that, if you would have bowed to their desires, you would have went to hell for all eternity. You would have suffered forever while you had maybe 60 good years here. See, Jesus was more interested in exceeding their expectations. You know, we are waiting for God to conquer Rome, and God wants to conquer death. We're waiting for God to change our current circumstances. He has already changed your eternal circumstances. He came for more than you can ask, think, or imagine. And some days we get mad because God hasn't met my, my expectation today. But he has already taken care of something that you could have never taken care of yourself. And that was your eternity. You know, my friends, there comes a moment when we have to let go of our Palm Sunday expectations of Jesus. There comes a moment when we've got to lay those expectations down. Because God is not going to meet all of your expectations. Can I tell you today, on Easter Sunday morning, he exceeded them all. He conquered the grave. He conquered death. 
He gave you a home in heaven. There are streets of gold. No more tears, no more mourning, no more suffering, no more pain. There will be grand reunions, grandpas and grandmas, children and grandchildren. There will be such a party in heaven one day when we get to come together and see Jesus face to face. I can say all the things that Jesus hasn't done in your life, there will be a day, one event, one moment in time, but it's all going to make sense. That's the day you can see Jesus face to face. See, Jesus loved those people so much, he didn't give them what they expected. He gave them what they needed. He gave them what they needed. They needed a Savior. And he became that for them. He became that for you today. That's what he is for you today. Jesus has not met all of my expectations. He has met my need. My need was a Savior. He gave that to me. And maybe today you're a little bit mad at God. Maybe today you're frustrated because you're not where you thought you would be. You didn't get what you thought you were going to get in this life. Maybe today you're kind of haunt off that you're having some of the problems that you're having, some of the sickness, some of the disease, some of the pain. Maybe today God hasn't done exactly what you expected in life. I'm going to tell you today, God's going to do exactly what you needed, and that was the Savior. And you ought to worship Him because of that. We should be a people who put our palm branches up high and wave them and praise the Lord because we have a Savior, and He died on the cross for people like us. He's given us eternity, and I'm so thankful for that today. Are you? Are you? Let's lay down our Palm Sunday expectations. Let's remember we have a Savior in heaven who died for us. Father, I pray today that if there's somebody in this house, somebody in this place today who doesn't know Jesus is their Lord and Savior, I pray, Holy Spirit, at this moment you're going to move into their life and you're going to open up a window, open up a door of understanding for them. Lord, help all of us to realize today that we are sinners and to fall short of your glory. That one day we messed up, one day we, one day we let sin into our life, and because of that we have eternal damnation. Because of that we have eternal separation from you, Lord. And the only hope for us was to have a Savior come to this world and die in our place. And Jesus, today I thank you, I worship you, I praise you that you made a decision to be a sinless sacrifice for people like us. I thank you that when you rode into Jerusalem, you had a plan that was greater than any plan that anyone had that day. That plan wasn't to sit on a throne on earth, it was to hang on a cross. And Jesus, I want to thank you that you give us the opportunity to accept that sacrifice into our own life. That we can just pray, Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I've messed up, I've fallen short. Not many you wanted me to be. And today I accept Jesus as my Savior. I will lay my life down, Jesus, and I will take up yours. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. Thank you for living for me. Thank you for raising from the dead for me. Thank you for making a home in heaven for me. I am sorry that I've been angry at the times you haven't met my expectations. But today, Jesus, I realize you met my greatest need. And I ask you into my life today. Start a relationship with you. Holy Spirit, if someone needs to, may they pray that prayer today and start on a new journey, a new relationship with you. And God, if some man or woman in this place has been angry at you, just lay that down today. Because you have met our needs according to your riches. Thank you, Jesus, for giving us what we need. Thank <laughs> you.